I should just hand over the virtual floor to you, Jacob. Uh, maybe first I should introduce you. So Jacob is a part three student who's just started the maths uh, part three in, 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 at DAMP. And despite his young academic age, he already has three papers on three separable, separ uh, separate topics. I think they range from entanglement theory to invariant quantum subspace theory to this work uh, that we've done recently together on, on um, quantum non-classicality in, in, in certain systems. So um, yeah, with that, uh, thanks for, for coming and giving this talk, Jacob, and, and I'm looking forward to seeing it. Right, so uh, thanks for the introduction and thanks everyone who's tuned in. Um, today, I'm gonna talk about some recent work that um, David and I did along with Nicole Junger Halpin from MIT. Um, about something called the Kirkwood-Dirac quasi-probability distribution. If you haven't heard of that, that's fine. We'll uh, introduce it fairly, fairly thoroughly soon. Um, but it's roughly a, a useful formalism for talking about non-classicality and non-commuting operators in um, quantum experiments. So our work led to a, led to a paper, the title is there, um, in case you want to just bring it up, it's, it's on the archive so you can sort of read along if you want while I'm talking. Um, and this paper basically uh, defined what it means for this uh, KD, this Kirkwood Dirac distribution, which I'll call the KD distribution, to be non-classical. And we, we specify exactly when it becomes non-classical, so when you see quantum effects. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, as David said, please feel free to ask any questions. I kind of, I kind of wish there was a way that people could just butt in and interrupt with questions, but I I'm not sure if that's possible, um, so we might have to just wait till the end, but do do send them to the chat. So the talk will be roughly structured as follows. <clears throat> Firstly, I'll introduce the KD distribution and um, try and give some motivation for it, give some of its properties, uh, why should we care about it, and then we'll define what it means for it to be non-classical. In the second section, which is really the, the bulk of the talk, We'll talk about the result of our paper, which is um, to define to determine when this KD distribution becomes non-classical, and we'll be we'll try and explain what this means. The conditions tied to the non-commutation, and the third section is kind of a bonus section if we have time, um, which is we using this KD distribution we can define a useful measure of how non-classical a quantum experiment is, and in our paper we we proved a bound on that non-classicality. Um, but the second section is really the meat of the talk. And um, if we don't have time for the third section, that's, that's not an issue. So the KD distribution is, uh, is a quasi probability distribution, which means that it is basically like a classical probability distribution, except that we loosen certain conditions. Um, in the case of uh, quantum mechanics and what we're gonna be talking about during this talk, the condition that we loosen is that we no longer require probabilities to be between zero and one, which seems kind of strange at first. And I think the natural reaction is, why should we bother with that? Like, what's the what's the point of considering probabilities that don't behave like normal probabilities that kind of could be complex or negative? Um, and I don't want to get too philosophical about this. I there's a quote from Dirac. You can read it and make of it what you will, but I, I don't really want to claim that these probabilities map onto the real world in the same way that normal probabilities would. Like, what, what would a probability of I mean, for instance? I, I just want to say that they're useful. Um, that's why we should care about these things, because they come up all the time in calculations and in different areas of quantum, quantum mechanics, quantum information, as we'll show in a minute. And um, they sort of pop up in us, like, they turn out to just be a really useful useful tool almost to define um, to do calculations and to measure other effects. So probably the most famous example of quasi probability distribution is one that you might have heard of already, or you probably have if you're working in quantum information called the Wigner function. Um, and the idea behind that is that in classical uh, statistical mechanics, you might have some probability distribution over phase space. So like a single particle moving in one dimension will have a two dimensional phase space and there'll be some kind of cloud of probability associated with where it could be. Um, 
But in the case of quantum mechanics, that doesn't quite carry over because you can't um, you can't ascribe sharp values of both x and p to a particle at the same time. There's always going to be some uncertainty on the order of h bar. Um, so you can't just naively just put a probability distribution on phase space, but you can do something which kind of works similarly, which is this thing called the Wigner function on the right here. And you can see that the Wigner function becomes uh, negative in certain places. Um, so it's not a true probability distribution, but it does keep some properties that we like. So for instance, um, if, the, if we fix, for instance, x, we fix the position, and then we integrate over the momentum, we get the probability that the particle is at that position um, and vice versa for swapping for the other way around. Um, so we would say that the Wigner function has the right marginal probability distributions. Um, and there are some other properties that we like that it has. <clears throat> so we could ask, is there a similar thing that we can do for finite dimensions? Um, this, even if particle just moving on a one dimensional line is infinite dimensional, has an infinite dimensional Hilbert space because it's uh, moving on a continuum. So we can ask, what about experiments that we care about in quantum information where there's only finitely many dimensions of Hilbert space? Can we do a similar sort of um, a similar sort of construction when when our measurement operators aren't commuting? So the setup is roughly as follows: we have a state row in some finite dimensional Hilbert space. We have some observables a and f. And we want to assign some sort of quasi probability to the joint outcome of the a and f measurements. We can eigen decompose a and f into projectors. Um, we don't really care about the eigenvalues of a and f in this talk, or in my opinion, ever in, <laughs> in quantum mechanics. Maybe that's controversial. Um, we really care about their, um, the projection, their, their decompositions into projectors, because those correspond to measurement results. So what we want is some function Q, which is the quasi probability that we want to define, which takes in two projectors. Um, corresponding to two measurement results and give some, in general, complex number. We're going to allow it to be complex um, because that's the condition we're loosening. So when we define this, we want to decide on some probability, sorry, some uh, properties that we should keep of um, standard probability distributions. So I'm not going to go through this slide fairly quickly because it's quite, um, it's a bit of a detour, but I think it's good for motivation. So. Here are some probability, uh, some properties from classical probability distributions, which we might want to keep. Um, and beneath there, you can see the sort of mathematical counterparts. Um, I won't sort of read them out to you, but you can you can see that each of these is probably quite a natural a natural thing to ask of a quasi probability distribution. So these are all properties that we'd want it to have. And here is a function which, or here is the quasi probability distribution, which. Um, John Kirkwood on the left there, and then subsequently Dirac on the right, uh, defined, um, and it does satisfy all of these all of these conditions. Um, I think Kirkwood defined it for use in statistical physics, um, statistical quantum physics, and Dirac was using it for more foundational stuff. Um, he was getting a bit more philosophical, but you can quickly check. Again, we won't go through it, but you can kind of you can see that all of these conditions are satisfied by that definition of Q. Importantly, Q can be complex. Um, <clears throat> we'll see some examples in a minute of, of explicit um, times where Q can be complex, but you might also want to just come up with an example for yourself if, if, you, uh, if you feel inclined just to see that Q can in general be complex. Um, which is maybe a bit surprising. If it was just, for instance, if you got rid of the Q here, if it was just trace row P, then that thing would always be real because um, it'd be the expectation of a, of a Hermitian operator, but the PQ allows it to become complex. So it is a quasi probability distribution, not a, not a standard probability distribution. Um, a bit of a side note, um, although I think this is maybe something that's, um, I think it might be interesting to discuss. It might raise some uh, discussions later is that these um, conditions that we've put on Q aren't actually enough to uniquely determine Q. They don't force Q to have this, this KD distribution form. So a really nice thing to have would be, could we somehow um, modify these conditions or could we somehow add some extra sort of natural physical, physically motivated conditions 
which would force Q to be this function here. Um, if anyone has any ideas for that, I'd be super keen to hear them. Um, Cause I think that would make quite a nice, a nice theorem. But in any case, this is the operator that we're going to use, and the counterexamples to you know other operators which satisfy these conditions turn out to be really inelegant, really ugly. So this is by far the most elegant version. So at least it's uh, motivated by by elegance as well. Um, so this is the distribution we'll be using. And just to simplify things, we're going to make a couple assumptions. They're not strictly necessary, but they do make things easier, and you don't lose much. Um, they, we can instantly generalize things at the end again. So we're going to assume that A and F are non-degenerate. So they have, um, we can uh, uniquely give their eigenbases. We're also going to assume that the state is pure. I'll just call the state Psi instead of the projector onto Psi. And just to clean up notation, we're going to write Q subscript AF to denote the quasi probability assigned to the joint outcome labeled by A and F um, instead of this kind of ugly thing with projectors on the left. So with those changes, this is the definition that we're going to be working with of the quasi probabilities. Um, maybe in this form, it's even easier to see that this thing can become complex. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll see that in a minute. So why do we care about the KD distribution? Again, because it's useful, I'm not going to make any big philosophical claims about it, but it's it comes up in all sorts of um, all sorts of areas of quantum information. And I'm not really going to delve too much into any of these because um, it would take us too far afield. But any of these, you could talk for a long time about the connections of the KD distribution um, with those areas. Um, and in case anyone I just kind of just dumped a bunch of titles on this slide in case any of them catch your eye. <clears throat> in case any of them catch your eye and, and you're interested, you can you can go and look them up. But um I'm not gonna talk any any more about any of them specifically. Something that's maybe worth quickly noticing is that um in in some papers like these KD distributions pop up, but they're not necessarily um they might be like <clears throat> ever so slightly different from the way that we've described them. Like for instance um, in this paper about consistent histories by Hartle, there's, I think they take the real part of the KD distribution. Um, in this paper about heat fluctuations, they, I think, apply like a dephasing channel to the to the state before they stick it in the formula. But it basically, I mean, it's, it is still the KD distribution. It might just look a little, a little different at first glance because um, they might have introduced some other, some other kind of uh, operations. But yeah, it, it appears all over the place. If the KD distribution only contains um, only contains uh, non-negative numbers, then it's just a standard uh, standard probability distribution, and so you would expect that nothing <clears throat> nothing quantum is really happening. You've modeled the whole experiment by just a standard probability distribution, um, and yeah, you'd expect no uh, like operationally, you'd expect no quantum advantages or no um, sort of uh, signatures of, of quantum effects in measurement. Um, but when you have negative or non-real quasi-probabilities, you can get um, various non-classical effects. Here's just an, an example of, of a couple or three. Um, and again, we won't delve into any of these, but each is interesting in their own right. Um, and this last one, I just brought up the paper because it was written by a few people in this group at the Cavendish here, um, including David, who you've, who you've just met. This probably is when I would ask for any questions, but I, I suppose that's uh, if you do have any questions, then then send them to the chat. And if, if someone can report back to me, if, if I've completely lost everyone and the, these definitions haven't made sense, I'd like to know. But otherwise, I'll, I'll soldier on. I'll, I'll let you know if anyone writes something outrageous in, in the chat. <laughs> Great, thanks. So um, this so we'd like to know when are these quasi probabilities negative or non-real, since that's when we get these sort of uh, signatures of quantum effects happening. Um, the same question was asked of the Wigner, uh, the Wigner function 50 years ago, almost, and was answered really nicely. You can tell a paper's good when it has a, an abstract that short. Um, and we, would, we wanted to ask the same question about the KD distribution. So when's the KD distribution non-negative? 
or conversely, um, when does the KD distribution go non-classical? When does it contain like complex and negative probabilities? This is the thing that we wanted to quantify. So the first guess might be it's when your measurement operators don't commute. That sort of seems to be the, the standard for when you get quantum effects or when you get um, you know, non-commutation leads to these uh, non-sharp values. And so you might expect that you can't use a probability distribution. Uh, this is easy to see this isn't quite right because even though A and F don't commute and so they don't share a joint eigenbasis, they still might share some, uh, some eigenvectors. So Psi could still be a joint eigenstate of both, in which case Psi would still have um, a sharp value of both A and F, and you could just use a probability distribution. So that's not quite right. The second guess, which I think is quite a natural guess, is that you also demand that rho doesn't commute with A or F. So Psi can no longer be an eigenstate of A and F. Um, and A and F also don't commute. And I, this is kind of the, I think this is like a, probably what I thought before we started working on this project, which is this would be like the natural guess of when things should become non-classical. Um, but there is actually a counterexample. Um, this is the counterexample we used in our paper. I think that we'll, we'll, we'll get to some more kind of instructive, we'll, we'll be able to create some more instructive counterexamples soon once we've done a bit more, um, a bit more of the maths. But you can check that um, these are some operators acting on a four dimensional Hilbert space and they don't commute, none of them commute, but the, the Kirkwood Dirac distribution they give rise to is, um, lies in the interval zero one. So things kind of look classical. In a sense, the, the uh, non-classicality is being hidden. Um, the state is orthogonal to some of the measurement results so that they, can, they never actually happen. Um, and somehow the non-commutation is, is in very loose terms being hidden by this, uh, um, by the fact that some of the results aren't happening. Um, another way to think of it is another sort of hand wave you think way to think about it is that if the non-commutation of the operators happens on the orthogonal subspace to Psi, then you won't see it. So we'll be a bit more precise with that in a minute. So the way that we're gonna go about on answering this question of when the KD distribution is non-classical is basically to say, let's assume that the KD distribution is classical and then derive some conditions that have to hold. Um, and then obviously if those conditions are violated, we know that something non-classical is happening. Right, so this is getting into the sort of slightly more slightly more technical part of the talk, although we're not gonna go into um, a huge amount of detail. Um, but so the first step of, of how we answer this is to just um, tidy things up by rescaling A and F uh, by a phase. So you can rescale either of those vectors by a phase um, and they'll still remain eigenvectors. Um, and we do that so that this part of the, um, of the quasi probability is non-negative. In other words, if there's any um, sort of complex or negative parts, it's sort of hiding in this overlap here of F with A. Um, the thing that we're gonna derive is uh, in the end will be independent of the phases of A and F. So if you're kind of worried about this rescaling, you can see what we get to at the end and then you can check that, oh, okay, if, we've, if we change the phase back, this thing is still true. So don't worry too much about that. But yeah, the idea is that if our quasi-probability distribution is non-negative, then that requires that this overlap of F with A is non-negative unless psi is orthogonal to one of A or F. So this is quite a, this is quite an important point. Um, so I'm gonna say it in a couple other, a couple slightly different ways just to see if one of them sticks. If the KD distribution is classical, then F dot A can only be negative or complex when psi is orthogonal to one of A or F. Um, so yeah, we, we only really care about the measurement results which aren't orthogonal to Psi. Um, if they're orthogonal to Psi, then they can do whatever they want. They can have whatever overlap they want with each other. But if the A and F aren't orthogonal to Psi, they need to have non-negative overlap, which I think kind of makes sense um, intuitively. Like if they're orthogonal to Psi, then obviously we don't care about them because they're just, uh, 
they're irrelevant measurement results, they're never going to happen. So with that in mind, we make the following definitions. We call NA the number of the A measurement results, which are not orthogonal to Psi. So in other words, that's the number of A's that we care about. And the same for F. So NF is the number of F's which are not orthogonal to Psi. So that's the number of F's we care about. Then the result of our, um, our paper is that this, if we have a classical um, KD distribution, that inequality must hold. Um, so that basically gives a, a an upper bound on the number of kind of allow, like possible measurement results we have. Where I mean possible means non-zero probability. So um, only so many of the measurement results can be uh, non-orthogonal to psi. D is the dimension of the Hilbert space, by the way. I'm not sure if I defined that. I have lied to you a little bit, actually. There is a small kind of technical correction term, um, but I I don't want to worry too much about that. But there, um, if you look in the paper, it will look a little bit different. And that's to deal with the case where if some A equals an F, then um, you have to like slightly loosen the right-hand side of this inequality. Um, we'll, we'll cover that in a minute, but it's the real take home the take home message is this inequality here. So I'm not going to, um, as I said, I'm not going to like try and prove this rigorously because it's, um, it is a little bit fiddly. And if you look in the paper, I, I think the explanation in the paper will certainly do a, a better job than, um, than what I could do in this talk. It is, you know, it requires a couple of appendices and things and it's a, <laughs> it takes a bit of time. But we can get a decent amount of intuition just by looking at an example. So for instance, um, we're going to work in three dimensions. And Psi will be orthogonal to one of the A vectors. So NA is 2. But Psi isn't orthogonal to any of the F vectors. So, um, so NF is 3. I'm also going to pretend we're working in real space instead of complex space, because I want to draw it. And I don't have access to complex dimensions. Not yet. So our a vectors are in blue on the left. Our f vectors are in orange or red on the right. Um, I've drawn them on separate axes, but we what we want to do is is uh, fit them together in a way so that they all have non-negative overlaps with each other. Um, so you can imagine f is like forming some axes basically, and we want to fit the two a vectors, the two blue vectors in the sort of upper octant formed by those axes. Um, it actually wasn't immediately obvious to me, like whether <laughs> how, how this could be done or, you know, whether how many ways you could do it in. So I actually had to sort of take a piece of card and this job, yeah, a piece of card and like sort of wedge it in the corner of my room and, and see if I could, you know, see how it fit. Um, that's about as far as experiments go for a theorist like me. But I found that and you probably could just tell from looking at it that there's only really one way of doing it. Or there's only maybe there's three ways if you count the three permutations, but you, you have to have the the um, the piece of paper sort of flush against one of the walls. Or in terms of vectors, you have to have some of the you have to have the A vectors just lining up with the F vectors. Um, in terms of measurements, that just means that A is um, A and F are A and F are compatible. They're they're commuting. Um, since they share an eigenbasis. So we sort of want to, we want to uh, exclude this degenerate case where um, the A's are just lining up with the F's. Um, so that's what we're going to do to to derive our inequality. We're just going to assume that none of the A's, I should say parallel, none of the A's are parallel to any of the F's because um, they could differ by a phase. So yeah, I'm not going to show the proof, but the rough idea is that we want to turn this geometry problem into an algebra, algebra problem. So we define this uh, unitary U, which changes the A basis to the F basis. And then we can turn these kind of non-negative overlap conditions into the condition that the first NA rows of the first NF columns are all non-negative, um, where we've potentially reordered some of the rows and columns to sort of get the get everything, get all the non-negative entries in the top left. Um, this is uh, a, a bit fiddly and delicate, but here's, <laughs> here's what happens in the paper. We're not going to run through it, but um, basically you sort of, 
chase the elements around the matrix and you find that some of them have to be zero and some of them have to be non-negative and all this stuff and eventually we, it leads us to this inequality here <coughs> um this was assuming that a and f uh, none of the a's and f's were parallel if we if we allow some of the a's and f to be parallel then we we slightly loosen our inequality um so we can define that and add it to the right hand side but then we've actually sort of overcounted because some of them might be orthogonal to psi so we subtract off this other correction but i really wouldn't worry too much about these correction terms um the idea is is basically this main inequality here if if you want non class sorry if you want classicality and no like degenerate cases where a and f are parallel then this this original part here has to be satisfied so for instance you can check um you can check in this case with the numbers two three three that the left hand side of the inequality will be 10 and the right hand side of the inequality will be nine so the inequality is violated um without the correction terms and so you know that there has to be some sort of uh the only way to do it will be some degenerate case <clears throat> um i should just briefly mention as well that it also uh the same thing works with a and f being degenerate we assumed at the start that they had these uh unique eigenbases but it basically works the same if a and f are de degenerate um so there's the theorem that we got and also and i haven't actually written this down but it also works pretty much the same if rho is a mixed state um instead of these being defined in terms of pa psi being non-zero you just have pa rho being non-zero um it generalizes really naturally um so just looking at the time, I think I'm not going to have time to do the third section, which I said is fine. But um, I, I'd like to just quickly say what I think this inequality means in a sort of intuitive way, and then we'll wrap up. Um, so as we said before, um, the, the idea is that the, by being orthogonal to some of the measurement results, the, the state can sort of hide some of the non-classicality that's going on um, due to the non-commutation of the measurement operators. And what this, what this inequality really does is it says how many of the measurement operates, sorry, how many of the measurement results have to be hidden, quote unquote, in order for the no non-classicality to show up at all. Um, so if you sort of do some rearrangement of this inequality, you can phrase it in a different way, which is to say that um, in order to be, um, to be to appear classical in order to have no um, negative or complex quasi probabilities psi has to be orthogonal to at least d over two of the measurement results so at least half the dimension there are there are two d measurement results in total and psi has to be orthogonal to d over two of them to hide the non-classicality so in other words it has to be orthogonal to a quarter of the measurement results at least um, I think this is quite a nice way of thinking about the inequality and I'm sorry that I haven't written it down in that form. Um, but I, I think that that's basically the intuition of what's going on, which is that, um, so I can just by being orthogonal to a quarter of the measurement results, it can hide all of the non-classicality, which is maybe a surprising kind of, um, like it's, it's surprising how much, uh, how much can be hidden, um, by psi being orthogonal to just a few of the measurement results. So yeah, I think um, this last bit is is unimportant and unrelated. Um, so I'm going to skip through that. But yeah, the, the takeaway point of this talk is the first bullet point here. Um, negative or non-real KD probabilities are strictly more non-classical than just non-commutation. And we gave a condition which describes exactly when non-classicality happens. Cool. So that's uh, that brings us to the end. If there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. And if you think of anything that you'd... Uh, like to ask about like after the talk then my email's there or, or or if there's just any like even if it's not a question even if it's just to tell me like that talk was horrible and or, or this result is terrible or, you know i'd love to hear anything so uh, there's my email cool thanks uh, thanks a lot jacob it was very refreshing to see like a proper theoretical maths talk so uh, we, we had one at the beginning of the series but then we've had quite a bit of experimental talks so it's good to mix things up and I think you did like a really excellent job of
of pinning down what actually happens in this rather mathematical paper. Um, meanwhile, people uh, would think about questions to ask in the chat. Um, I thought maybe, so if, if you go back to one of the kind of slides in the beginning of, of the presentation where we talked about the properties, the, the probability distribution or the quasi probability distribution has to have. Yeah. Um, yeah, I thought you would ask about this. Yeah. This is maybe, <laughs> I was wondering whether I uh, should have showed these because I think no, no, no. Maybe it gets a little bit, uh, I don't know. I'm not quite confident on this, but go on, ask away. No, no, no. I, I mean, I think it's perfectly fine. But what I was wanting to get at is what, what additional type of properties do you think we would need in order to, to make sure that the only distribution we could use would be the KD distribution? I mean, it might be that if you knew the answer to this question, <laughs> Uh, there would be another paper out there, but um... yeah, I mean that's a that is a great question, um, and so that I, I don't have an answer. If I did, I would I would have presented it, and I have to say that while I was preparing for this talk, I I really went down the rabbit hole of <laughs> of trying to think of um, think of some extra properties which would uniquely determine this function, <clears throat> and so I haven't got those properties, but there are a couple things that I have a couple ideas, and there's there's a couple things I can say. Um, one of them is that, so one sort of maybe hint towards how we could modify these properties is this Q here is basically a really nice function. <clears throat> it's, it's linear, sorry, <clears throat> it's linear in each of its arguments in row P and Q. Um, whereas the conditions we've given it here, these two kind of um, conditions that reflect sigma add additivity they, they're a bit weaker than linearity. They only demand linearity when, for instance, if you look at this first one, um, does my mouth show on the screen, by the way? Can you see what it I'm does. sort of pointing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this first one, you sort of require linearity only if P1 and P2 are orthogonal projectors um, and same for Q. So we're sort of only asking a, a weaker condition here. And yet Q is this thing which satisfies something much stronger, which is linearity in each of the arguments and, and also in, in, in row. Um, and so you might say, well, shouldn't we just add the condition? Shouldn't we just get rid of these if bits here and just ask it to be linear? And then maybe, maybe we'd be done. Um, firstly, I'm not sure if we'd be done. But also secondly, the point is these things should be physically motivated, these extra assumptions. Um, and I can't think of a good way of justifying full linearity in each of the arguments from a physical perspective um, in a way that satisfies me. Um, so ideas of things that might be, um, might be interesting to look at um, would be, for instance, there's a, there's a sort of equivalent of Bayes rule for, um, for, uh, quasi -pro for this KD distribution. Um, you can use Bayesian reasoning, like Bayesian inference on it. Um, and it might be that if you sort of ask that the, the quasi probability distribution should obey something like Bayes rule, then you can narrow it down to be this thing. Um, I'm, so, I'm sort of in two minds about whether that would be whether that's going to work, but that would be something worth trying. Um, and also, there are other things which are sort of other weak assumptions, but maybe if you throw enough of them in, then they'll eventually narrow it down. Like, for instance, something that um, something that you want to be the case is that given this collection of quasi probabilities, you want to be able to reconstruct the state. So it should be like a, a by uh, an injection in, in some sense. You should uh, you should lose no information by passing to the quasi probability formalism. So maybe that's another condition that might narrow it down a bit. But I don't think any of these has really quite answered it. And so I, I would be really keen to hear um, anyone's ideas of kind of properties that you could add, which would narrow down what Q can be. Yeah, I think I mean it is a really interesting question. I think. Maybe I'll add a little comment or add to your discussion here about why I would think it's interesting because there is this result from, I think, 2008 or 2009 by Rob Speckens, where he's shown that if, if you can prove that an experiment requires negativity in any quasi-probability representation of the experiment, then you've proven that this experiment possesses quantum contextuality, which is this quantum resource. So just to reiterate, if you can prove that 
every quasi probability expression of that experiment is negative, then, then you've proved contextuality. So if you could find physically motivated conditions saying that the KD distribution is the distribution to look at for discrete systems, then you would implicitly have proved that contextuality is directly linked to, to the Kirkwood Dirac distribution's negative values, which is something that would appeal, I think, to a lot of, lot of quantum people. Um, yeah, if anyone has any ideas about that, do, uh, do get in touch, because I think this is quite, a, quite an interesting question to think about. Are you open for questions? Yeah, yeah, ask away. So oh, yeah, we are, yeah. Can you go to the slide where you've got your, your three matrices um, that mutually don't commute? Um, uh -oh. It's not going to turn out that they commute, is it? No, I don't know. No, no, no. I haven't checked it. They, they, uh, I'm just going to assume you're, you're right about it. Yeah. So you're, you're saying here that for these three matrices, that this quantity QAF is between zero and one. And um, you're then saying that, that this, this then represents a classical system. I mean, my question is, could a quantum system, I mean, a truly quantum system not exhibit a value of Q between zero and one? Right, okay. Yeah, that's a good question. And I, um, I didn't go I probably should have said more about like um, interpretations and things because that's what people might be interested in. But um, there's no such thing as a classical system, right? Everything is a quantum system, um, at least to the best of our knowledge. So of course things can be behave classically. And when we say, uh, and they can look classical, but deep down they are quantum. So when we say is something classical, what we really mean is it, does it have some, is it behaving in a way that looks kind of classical to us? Like a football looks kind of classical. It's not, it's not classical, but it kind of looks classical because of, you know, you can define some quantities and then look at them and then you, they, they seem to behave in a classical kind of way. So obviously this thing, these, I mean, we've, we've defined this system in terms of a Hilbert space with measurement operators, right? The state is a density operator. Of course it is quantum, um, but the, the 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 point that we're trying to we're trying to get across is that it seems to you know just by making measurements on this quantum system there's a there's a sense in which you you're not really seeing the quantumness you it's kind of being hidden from you um in parts of hilbert space which you can't access so yeah i, I mean i i agree with you that this certainly is a quantum system there's no denying that every you know everything is but um it's the, the we don't want to overstate what what our, what our result is all we're saying is that the the quantumness is kind of not immediately available to us so i suppose one of the things that that happens with with a quantum system once you start scaling it up um the hilbert space then grows exponentially um i mean is there a you've got a, a four dimensional Hilbert space here. If you had many of these, and I don't know if this is a meaningful question, but if you have many of these interacting in some way or potentially entangling, what happens when you start taking the nth direct product of these? Um, yeah, that would actually be- uh... Of the non-commutivity, there is no way of reducing the problem to a polynomial growth. It's still going to be growing exponentially. I think I would, so I think firstly, I would, I, I want to just say that um, at no point in this talk did I mention entanglement. And I know that like quantum information people just love entanglement and I do as well, but this really is like, um, this really doesn't see the entanglement structure of Hilbert space at all, these results. Um, and so in a sense, entanglement is a completely separate type of non-classicality to, to what we're talking about here. But I do think that the idea of, of scaling with system size, um, I mean, the, the way that you phrased it reminded me of, of what they do in quantum statistical physics, where you sort of take, for instance, the, the n-fold um, tensor product of a system with itself and then trace over um, all but one of them, for instance. 
and and take the limit as n goes goes large. Um, so yeah, I think an interesting question might be. Um, I mean, maybe this isn't what you're getting at, but but an interesting question might be if you have negativity in a system, um, so you have this non-classicality available, and then you um, sort of couple it to itself uh, a large number of times, essentially, or you couple it, couple it to some sort of bath, uh, which is also quantum. Do you, does that negativity disappear in the in the large n limit, or does it sort of um, is it robust against against uh, interaction with with the environment, essentially? Um, I actually think this is something which has been looked into before. Um, if I was a bit more well versed, I would just uh, pull up the paper. But um, it certainly seems like an interesting question to think about. So hopefully that's a uh, is that is that the right kind of interpretation of what you were saying? Yes, no, it, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Well, I, I actually during my PhD, we we did these sorts of things, taking nth direct products, and um, then. Um, Actually, in one of the things I worked on, we, we, we then took the limit as n went to zero, which then made all of the matrices infinite. And uh, that's, uh, it was a thing called the replica trick. That's got a lot of attention recently. <laughs> uh, so long ago. No, the replica, no, I'm, I'm not joking. The replica trick is, uh, is everywhere in uh, black hole information at the moment. Oh, is it? Right. Yeah, okay. yeah, it's a big deal. Yeah. Were there any questions in the chat? Not that I can see, no. I think you've baffled everyone. It was... I, I have a, a, question. a question from the, from the panel. Um, so you mentioned that every system is quantum, but then we can also see a difference between a, a quantum-like quasi-probability distribution and a classical-like one where the probabilities are uh, between 0 and 1 and are real and positive. In a quantum um, experiment, would it be a challenge to find this negative or uh, complex KD distribution? Or is this the norm that you get and the classical distribution is actually the fringe case? OK, yeah, good question. Um, it is absolutely the norm to have negative, negative quality probabilities. It's difficult to hide quantumness um, in the sense that if, okay, so I mean, clearly A and F have to be non-commuting to, to have some non-classicality, but provided A, that our measurements are non-commuting, um, if you pick a random state row, then you're almost surely gonna see negative quasi-probabilities, um, almost surely in a kind of uh, like a measure theory sense. Um, so yeah, good question. And I think that's one of the reasons that yeah, it, it, it would be easy to be tricked by this result into thinking it's like a sort of 50-50 thing because it's like, well, either it happens or it doesn't. But um, yeah, I think the intuition is, is basically that it's difficult to hide non-classicality. Um, but then again, you could also ask, well, okay, it might be non-classical, but how non-classical is it on average? You know, if you, it, you might have some slightly negative or slightly complex quasi-probabilities um, and those probably wouldn't be detectable in in a in a measurement uh, in a, in an experiment. So, you know, then you could start asking, okay, how how non classical do you expect a measurement to be, um, and do you expect to be able to detect it if you choose some random state? Um, and that would be not a question that we've answered, but it's something a little bit similar to what the third part of this talk was um, was sort of dealt with. But um, yeah, I, th I think the intuition is basically that you should expect negativity to come up. In a, in a quantum system, you should expect to see quantumness. Right. And then, so you mentioned this slightly negative. Do you have that the more negative an element is, the more quantum advantage you could pull out of that? I I mean, I really just want to say yes, because it seems, it seems so natural. Um, and I... But to be honest, I, I haven't actually like, um, because wait, where were all of these? Uh, yeah, all of the, I haven't like, <laughs> I haven't thoroughly read all of these papers, right? I've, I've read the bits with the KD, oh, I've lost them, but I've read the bits with the KD distribution involved, um, but I haven't like checked, okay, can we sort of um, go slightly beyond these papers and quantify exactly how much of this effect we get for how much um, non-classicality I, I really just, I really assume that 
the more negativity you have in your KD distribution, the more these effects are apparent. Um, I mean, in, okay, I can give you a sort of slightly better argument than that, which is that in some of these cases, you know that the um, the most non-classical things are going to be happening when your your measurement bases are mutually unbiased. Um, and we proved in our paper that when the that the this kind of measure of non-classicality, which we define, um, is maximized when the when the bases are non-biased. So, like the, the you have the most negativity in the KD distribution. Um, we define the negativity this way, just in case you're interested. Um, you have the most negativity in a KD distribution when the bases are unbiased, and that's also when you have sort of the most pronounced quantum effects. So, you you kind of want to then infer, okay, basically the more the more negativity you have, the more the more quantum effects you have. But you're right that we, we haven't been super rigorous with that. And you could, I'm sure, make this much more like ro robust. And the final follow up to this, is there a limit to how negative something can become? <laughs> well, thanks for asking, Hugo. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Isn't that convenient? Um, so when defined when defined this way oh i should ask did you mean like the, a limit to how negative an individual yeah individual quasi probability can be oh, okay um in which case yes there is definitely a limit can i think of it off the top of my head i mean each of these if you look at the definition of the quasi probabilities let me just find it um they're all inner products so they all have to be right they all should be, there we go. <clears throat> each of these inner products has magnitude less than one. Um, so each of these QAFs has to have magnitude less than one. Um, so I suppose a product quality probability can only be minus one. That's as, that's as negative as it can get. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. If that's all the questions, then uh, Probably uh, just thank everyone for, for tuning in. And uh, as I said, if anyone has any uh, questions they want to ask me on the uh, my emails at the end, there, let me just pull it up. Um, if anyone has any thoughts, especially about what David was asking about with the, the conditions for the, uh, determining the KD distribution, that would be really nice. But yeah, thanks everyone for, for tuning in. Well, thanks a lot to you, Jacob. I just thought I'd say to everyone that like, I highly recommend working with Jacob because as a physicist, we often like physicists. We often have like ideas and like sometimes fairly good intuition of, about what happens in systems. But proving things rigorously is something that we're not usually uh, mathematically talented enough to do. But Jacob definitely is. So so working with Jacob uh, with, with this type of things has been has been a really useful thing. So well, it's been I a pleasure pleasure working with you as well, David. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>